pray with me? Teach me, O oh God, how to say yes to your will and your way. We've lived enough to know that when we rebel and say no, life goes in a wrong direction. So again, I ask you to teach me to say yes. Whatever your way, whatever your will is, allow it to be well with my soul. God, I thank you for the gift of your word, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. That As we study and examine scripture, we might know the way in which you've called us to walk. I ask you now, God, to use my head and my heart, speak through my mind and my mouth. Have your way, O Holy Spirit. Your children are listening. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. As you all know, we're in the midst of a series where we've been sharing sermonically some of the core values for our lives and for our ministry as a church. It began with a spirit of excellence that we will be defined and determined as a people who've made a decision to live above mediocrity. On last week, I pressed upon you the need to be evangelical and to be certain that we are fulfilling the call of God upon our lives to share our faith openly, to lead others to salvation in Jesus Christ under our banner, Each One Win One. Because I will not be preaching at 11 o'clock, I want to pause that series and pick it back up next week. But there is a word from the Lord that I believe is real and relevant and profound for us today. And I ask that you would journey with me to the second book of the Bible written by the same author as the Gospel of Luke, and that would be the book of Acts of the Apostles. The same brother who pens the Gospel of Luke is the author of the book of Acts, that fifth book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. And I would that you journey with me to the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. And when you found that, if you're physically able, would you stand as together we reverence the reading of God's holy word from Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse number one, reading out of the New King James Version of the Bible. Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse number one. Then he, meaning Paul, came to Derbe and Lystra, Behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and came through the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And after they had come through Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. If you will, look at verse 6 and 7 again. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And after they had come through Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Today, I want to talk from the question, what does God want me to do? You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> what does God want me to do? This really was an interesting week for me. I had an opportunity, more so than ever, to have meetings with members. Typically, my week is so full with committees and visitations and large projects. But this week, God afforded me the opportunity to meet with a lot of members. And come to the conclusion, Brother Wellborn, that whenever someone comes into the office to meet with the pastor, they typically come with a set of questions that they're looking to have answered. Begin to reflect over what those questions are. Some people, Judy, they come with doctrinal questions. 
They want to understand how do we defend the doctrine of the Trinity and what does it mean to be Baptist? Or maybe they have a friend or a family member that has begun to worship in another faith tradition or another denomination and they're curious about how that denomination lines up with what we teach and what we preach. Some people come with doctrinal questions. Some people come, however, with questions that are rooted in a real struggle that they're going through. They're in the midst of a trial, a tragedy, some suffering, a storm. They come in asking, Pastor, can you help me understand why God is allowing this to happen and where I can find God in the middle of this struggle? People come in searching for answers as to why bad things happen to good people and why God would allow his chosen daughter, his favorite son, to walk through the experience that they're going through. Some people come and they have biblical questions. They want help understanding how to interpret a certain passage of scripture and how it applies to their lives. Most folk, when they come in and they walk into the office, Mark, they see that I've got a bunch of Dallas Cowboy hats on my banner. And inevitably, one of the questions people ask when they come in the office is how can you be from Chicago and be a Cowboy fan? Well, besides the fact that I'm educated, <laughs> I have to explain that's because my father was a Cowboy fan. And growing up with a Cowboy fan in the house, I knew nothing else other than the Dallas Cowboys, and that's how I became a Cowboy fan. Those are some of the questions that drive people in the office. But hands down, the most frequent question I'm asked in one way or another, in some shape or another, when people come into the office, that most of them come in struggling to discern what God's will is for their life. Hands down, 90% of those who sit down at the table with the pastor are not looking for my opinion or my conclusion. What they want is to hopefully believe that I might help them understand what God desires of them and what God wants them to do with a certain situation in their life. Yeah. Come in asking, what does God want me to do? Come in saying that I have a desire in my heart, but how do I know if it's God's will or if it's just what I want to do? Yeah. Come in at a crossroad have a critical decision to make and are wondering which path does God want me to walk on. They come in, they've been dating somebody for a long time and they want to know, God, is this the one or should we look for another? <laughs> they come in with this curiosity and concern of trying to discern what God's will is for their life. My brothers and sisters, I would suggest to you that hands down the greatest struggle all of us face as we walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter how big your Bible is, no matter how many Sundays you come to church, all of us at some point in our lives struggle with trying to understand what is God's will? What does God want me to do? What decision is God backing? What road does God want me to take? What job has God put his finger on? What relationship has God endorsed? What does God really want? want me to do. And somebody they ought to be able to give an early amen because you know that that's not always an easy answer. Amen. Discerning the will of God for the decisions of your life is not always easy. Why? Because God doesn't always speak his will in grand and glorious ways that are easy to understand. If you're a Bible student, you need to read first Kings chapter 19, when you go home, Elijah, one of the greatest prophets of God, has prayed to the Lord for God to reveal his will to him. And in chapter 19 of 1 Kings, Elijah says that a wind blew, and the wind was so strong that it began to shake the mountains. But God wasn't in that wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, and the earth began to shake and tremble, but God wasn't speaking through the earthquake. And then there was a great and grand fire that consumed everything, but God wasn't speaking in the fire. And after the wind and after the earthquake and after the fire, there was a still, small voice. And what Elijah understood is what we understand is that God doesn't always speak in earth-moving, shattering signs and symbols that give you clarity into what God wants, that sometimes the will of God is spoken in a still, small voice. Wouldn't faith be easier if God revealed his will in big ways? 
I mean, it'd be easier if God just bought a billboard on your way to work and put up what your instructions were for your life. God doesn't even have a Facebook page, won't even post what he wants you to do. God doesn't tweet you in the morning with your divine assignment. God has never sent you an email. God no longer speaks to a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Wouldn't it be easier if when you prayed for God to reveal his will, he would make it easy to discern in grand and glorious ways? But God speaks in still, small voices. Somebody today say, Reverend, I don't even know how you knew I was coming to church, but you're speaking to me right now because I'm at a crossroad in my life. I've got a critical decision to make. I've got to make a move, and, and I've pressed pause because I'm waiting on God to do something. I'm waiting on God to say something. I'm waiting on God to give me a sign. As a matter of fact, you came to church early on Sunday morning with the belief that somewhere between the call to worship and the benediction, God would make his will clear to you. You would know what to do, and you would no longer be confused. By the day you're struggling to know what God wants you to do. In order to help frame how we search and seek and discern the will of God, I want to categorize the will of God in four different ways. I want to give you four different ways to understand God's will for your life. The first one is what I call the predestined will of God. Somebody say the predestined will of God. God is sovereign. And the Bible says he orders our steps and numbers our days. And in his sovereignty, God has declared that there are some things that must and will happen to you no matter what. They are inescapable. They are unavoidable. They are foreordained. They are written in stone. That's, that's what God speaks to the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 1, verse 5, when he says to Jeremiah, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I had already ordained you to be a prophet. Jeremiah, you didn't have a career decision. You didn't have an option on what you were going to do. I declared from the foundations of the earth that these were the things that would happen to you, and you cannot escape them. That there are some predestined things God has willed for us. Now, Mark, in different theological beliefs, there's a question as to how much of our life is predetermined, predestined, preordained by God. But I believe that all of us can agree that there are some things that are totally under the control of God. The day you were born, the color of your skin, the gender you walk in, and even the day you die. And I would argue that between your birth and your death, which are both predestined by God, there are some other experiences of things you must go through, will go through, and there's no one or no thing that can keep you from dealing with what God has predetermined will go down in your life. God has a predestined will. But there's a second category I want to put, not just the predestined will of God, but can I tell you that there is also the prohibitive will of God. That there are some things God has said God does not want you to go through. God does not want you to do. Everybody has a no-no list. Things that God does not want to come into your world. Matter of fact, go back to the book of Genesis when God shapes Adam and Eve and places them in the garden. God gives them freedom and says, you need anything you want. Oh, but that tree right there is in my prohibitive will. You shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of the fruit of good and evil. That is a no-no for you. And for all of us, there are some prohibitive things that God has declared we shall not do, we should not experience, and we should not decide to do in our lives. Now, for many of us, the prohibitive will of God comes known through Scripture. As we read the Bible, we learn what God does not want for us. But I would suggest that even outside of Scripture, we are created with an inherent morality that gives us some discernment of the prohibitive will of God. You don't have to be a Bible-carrying Christian to know that killing is wrong. You don't have to go to anybody's church to know that lying is wrong. Now, now, that inherent morality may be distorted by culture and condition and context, but the reality is I believe that we are all born with some pre-wiring of the prohibitive will of God in our lives, the things God does not want us to do. There's a predestined will of God, the prohibitive will of God, but I would frame the third one as the providential will of God. These are the things God wants to do for us, the desires God has for us, 
the blessings God wants to provide. It's what he says to us in Jeremiah 29 when he declares, I know the plans I have for you. I know the thoughts I have. I know the blessings I want to give you. I, I know the doors I want to open. I know the land I want you to walk in. I, I know the good things that I have in store for you. Now, the trouble with the providential will of God is that it is never forced on you. You've got to choose it, which is what brings the fourth dimension of God's will in, and that is the permissive will of God, that there is a realm of my life that is not predetermined, but I have to enact the free will that God has given me in my imagio dei that allows me to make decisions that shape the world I live in, and God responds and reacts to the decisions that I make in his permissive will. He does not force me. He does not predetermine it. God sets before me a road of left or right, an up or down, of this or that, and it is up to me to make the decision in his permissive will of what will happen in my life because God permits me to make choices and decisions. And the bulk of my life is spent in the permissive will where I am making decisions that prayerfully line up with God's providential will for my life. Hear me, brothers and sisters. We're getting deep. I know, I know, but this is why you come to Alfred Street. That there is nothing in your world God is apathetic about. There's no decision you have to make where God says, I have no desire. Hear me, for every decision, God has a desire. No matter how trivial you think it is, God has a desire for every decision you have to make. God cares about what color socks you wear to church today. God cares about what road you took to get to Alpha Street. God cares about who you allow into your life as friend and romantic interest. God cares about what job you take. God cares about the career choices you make. God cares about who you associate with everything in your life. God has a desire for him. Now the struggle is that that is God's providential will. But in the permissive will where I make decisions, my struggle is how do I be certain that the decisions I make in his permissive will are perfectly aligned with his providential will? Because I don't always know what his providential will is. Life is at its best when my decisions match God's desire. Life is at its most fullest of joy and peace when I'm making decisions that are perfectly aligned with God's plan for my life. And conversely, life gets bad when my decisions stray from his providential will and start lining up with his prohibitive will. That when I start making decisions that line up with what God has said I should not do, that's when life goes wrong. Now, now, let me tell you that there's some decisions you make that can be misaligned with the providential will of God, and the damage is minimal. If God's desire was for you to wear black socks and you wore blue because you didn't pray about what color socks you should wear to church today, the damage is minimal. But if the will of God was for you to marry Tim and you married Tom, That could be misery. So the struggle is, how do I determine the providential will of God so that I am lining my decisions up with what God desires for me so that I can walk in the fullness of joy and peace that God has for me? How do I know what God wants me to do? Well, if you're a good Baptist, you probably say, read the Bible. And that, that's a good answer. I endorse that. I, I second that motion. Because if you read your Bible, you will be a better Christian. However, the Bible does not always reveal to you God's personal prescribed providential plan for your life. The Bible will tell you to worship God, but it won't tell you what church you ought to join. 
The Bible will tell you how to love your spouse, but it won't tell you that it was supposed to be Tim and not Tom. The Bible will tell you to make God the head of your home, but it won't tell you if you should build that home in Fairfax or PG. The Bible tells me some things, but it does not always give me the personal decisions I need to make in my daily living. I can't go to the Bible, open it up, find a book with my name on it where God has written me a letter to tell me everything I must do every day of my life. So again, how do I know what God wants me to do? Well, part of discerning that will of God, I believe we can glean some insight through the journey of the Apostle Paul. By the time we get to the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, Paul has already been converted and commissioned on the road to Damascus in chapter 9. And in chapter 13, he has already begun his first missionary journey, which comes to an end in chapter 15. By all reasonable accounts, the first journey has been successful. Paul and his brother Barnabas, his buddy, they've been traveling. and They've been preaching the word of God. They've had some ups and some downs, but overall, it's been a pretty good trip. The journey ends with them in Jerusalem, where there is a debate with Peter and the other apostles about the necessity of circumcision for Gentiles. And after they come to the end of that debate, you get to the end of chapter 15, and you'll find out that Paul and Barnabas have a violent disagreement. Paul is getting ready to start the second journey. He wants to take Barnabas, and Barnabas wants to bring Mark, the same author of the Gospel of Mark, who abandoned them in the first journey. Barnabas wants him back, and Paul, with an unforgiving spirit, says no. The Bible says the debate over John Mark got so hot that Paul and Barnabas separated ways. Barnabas begins to travel with John Mark. And the Bible says that Paul then goes down to Lystra and Derby, and it is there that he meets someone who's going to change his life. He meets a young brother by the name of Timothy. Timothy becomes Paul's mentee, his son in the ministry. It's the same Timothy to whom Paul would write his pastoral letters in First and Second Timothy. The Bible says that Timothy is strong in the faith. He's knowledgeable of the word of God because his mother is a Jew, but he's also able to minister to Gentiles because his father is a Greek. And Timothy is the personification of the ministry of Paul because he understands the word of God, but also has a heart for those who are not of the Jewish faith. And therefore, Paul and Timothy hook up and their ministry is successful. The Bible says they go down to Phrygia, they go down to Galatia, they are preaching and teaching the word of God. And in verse 5 of chapter 16, the Bible says that God added to the church daily, which means every day somebody joined the church. Every day somebody converted to Christianity. Every day someone gave their life to Jesus Christ. Every day they were baptizing. Every day they were given the right hand of fellowship. Every day they had to expand and build a new building because God had added to the church daily. And after being successful in Phrygia and Galatia, watch what the Bible says. Paul then determines that he wants to go to Asia, modern-day Turkey. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit did not allow it. And so then Paul says, well, let me go to Bithynia. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit did not allow it. Make certain you catch this when. Paul wants to go to Turkey, the Holy Spirit says no. And when Paul wants to go to Bithynia, the Holy Spirit says no. Now those who read the book of Acts, you take them well, well to make note of what the Holy Spirit does in the book of Acts. As you journey through verse one, chapter 1 to chapter 16, you'll see the Holy Spirit is responsible for a whole lot of things. The Holy Spirit empowers the apostles to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and all the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit adds to the church daily. The Holy Spirit gives Peter the boldness to preach Jesus Christ even under the threat of persecution. The Holy Spirit falls on the members of Cornelius' household to give Peter validation that God has called Gentiles into salvation. The Holy Spirit picks Paul and Barnabas and sets them out on their first missionary journey. The Holy Spirit identifies the believers that will connect themselves to the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit reveals the plot against Paul and Barnabas. The Holy Spirit does all of that. And then in chapter 16, we find another role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit 
prevents Paul and Barnabas from going in a direction that God doesn't want them to go. Make sure you catch this, that when their heart's desire is to go this way, if that was not where God wanted them to go, the Holy Spirit is what God uses to keep them from going in the wrong direction. When they are struggling to understand what God wants of them and where God would want them to go, when there's no scripture they can read to tell them what to do, when there's no pastor to sit down with to give them direction on what they ought to do, God speaks to them through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convicts them. The Holy Spirit guides them. The Holy Spirit directs them. The Holy Spirit reveals God's will. The Holy Spirit gives them clarity on what they the next move ought to be. It is the Holy Spirit that God uses to direct us when we're trying to discern what we ought to do. That God uses the Holy Spirit to be that still, small voice that tells you what God wants you to do. Now, now can I push this for just a minute? The question I have to ask and Mark, I'm glad you're here. You got a PhD in, in this stuff. Um, how does the Holy Spirit forbid them? The Bible says Paul wants to go to Turkey, and all we get is that the Holy Spirit didn't allow it. So, so what I'm trying to ask, because Luke didn't give us enough information, is how did the Holy Spirit do it? Because I need to know how God uses the Holy Spirit to speak. How does God use the Holy Spirit to block them from going into Turkey and Bithynia? There's no answer. M maybe, may maybe the boat they wanted to take uh, got a hole in it and was under maintenance, and that was it. M maybe the cost of the ticket was too high, it was out of their budget. Uh, m maybe they didn't have enough friends to go with them. I don't know how the Holy Spirit did, but this we know, that whatever was going on around Paul and Timothy... They did not see it as coincidence or accident or happenstance, but through the gift of the Holy Spirit, they were able to discern the signs around them as an indication of what the Lord did and did not want them to do. Because one of the primary gifts of the Holy Spirit is not talking in tongues, but discernment. That the Holy Spirit allows me to interpret the will of God around me so that when I am filled with the Holy Spirit, I can see and hear and discern what direction God is pointing me in. Hear me, my brother and my sister. God is not trying to play a game with you. God's will, he does not want it to remain a mystery. God is not trying to keep his will out of your vision. God wants you to know what he wants you to do. He wants you to know his will. He wants you to be obedient, and he gives you the Holy Spirit to be able to discern it. So, when you read the Bible in your devotional life and you come away with an understanding of what God wants you to do, Holy Spirit. When you come to church confused and somewhere between the singing of the song and the preaching of the sermon, a light shines and you got it now, you understand it made sense in your heart and in your head, that wasn't a choir and it wasn't a preacher. Holy Spirit. When you sit down with your pastor, your counselor, your therapist, your psychiatrist, and you talk to them, and when you're done talking with them, you now believe that God has spoken to you and you know what you're supposed to do, don't give it uh, the credit to the PhD on the wall. That's the Holy Spirit. When you've been praying for God to direct you and you wake up one day and you see signs around you that begin to speak God's will over your life, your neighbor saw the same thing and didn't get anything out of it. Why? Because that's the Holy Spirit. That the role of the Holy Spirit is to direct you in God's will. Now, 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 if that's how God speaks through the Holy Spirit, that means that there are two things you've got to do in order to discern what God wants you to do in every decision you've got to make. Can I drop them on you real quick? Number one, you've got to bathe your decision in prayer. God doesn't speak to folk who ain't speaking to him. If you want God to talk to you, you better talk to him. 
bathe it in prayer. God, tell me which way to go. God, make sure the motivations of my heart are correct. God, make your way clear to me. God, guide me. God, speak to my heart. God, point me in the right direction. And I wish I had some Bible readers that know that if you're trusting the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, he will what? He will direct, that, that's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 for those who are biblically illiterate. God will direct your path when you bathe your decision making in prayer. Not only do you have to pray, but sometimes, saints, you've got to fast. Now, I'm going to teach about fasting a few weeks in Bible study. We're getting ready to go on a corporate fast that the Lord it's placed in my heart as a church family. We're going to fast together, so you'll learn all about that. So don't try to figure out right now, does that mean I drink water? Do I eat fruit? Do I do this? Do this? No, no. Fasting is primarily you learning to silence the other voices around you so that you can clearly hear the still, small voice of God. You want to know why some of us have difficulty discerning God's will? You're on sensory overload. You got too much coming at you. Too much Facebook to sense God. Too many apps on your phone. Your phone has buzzed four times since you've been in church already. Too much Twitter. Too much reality TV. Too much J and B. That, that would be Jay-Z and Beyonce. You wonder why you can't discern the will of God when the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning is check your phone to read your emails, to see who tweeted you, how many new followers you got last night. And we're so overloaded with other things that we can't discern the will of God. So God says, I need you to pray and shut some stuff down. I, I need you to pray and turn some things off. I need you to pray and unplug some stuff so that you can hear my voice. And I'm a living witness that when you pray and you fast, you will hear the voice of God. When you pray and you fast, God will make his will known to you. When you pray and you fast, you'll have insight into what God is calling you to do. When you pray and you fast, God will give you clarity and vision of what he wants from you. Now, wait a minute, somebody, I know you, I know you, I just heard it. You said, hold on, Reverend, I've been praying. God hadn't showed me anything. I've been praying sincerely for God to direct me, and God hasn't told me which path to take. God hasn't pointed out what I ought to do. God hasn't made it clear. You've been praying, but you still don't know what God wants you to do. If, if I'm preaching to you, don't just wink, just wink. I got, I got you, got you, got you. You've been praying, but you still don't know. Okay, I want you to see what happens with Paul. Here's our deep lesson. Here's Bible study. Bible says that when Paul wanted to go into Turkey, the Holy Spirit, Colio, it, it, it forbid him from going. And then when Paul wanted to go into Bithynia, the Holy Spirit, Eao, the Holy Spirit did not permit it. But when they want to go to Macedonia, they get to Macedonia, watch this, because they, Paul had a dream he interpreted that the dream meant God wanted him to go to Macedonia, and so he goes to Macedonia by his own conclusion. Say with me. The Holy Spirit blocked Turkey. The Holy Spirit prevented Bithynia, but they got to Macedonia by their own conclusion. Okay, case okay, so Bible study. Come, 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 come. I know I lost you. Raise your hand. I'm coming. All right, here we go again. The Holy Spirit did not allow Turkey. The Holy Spirit did not permit Bithynia, but they got to Macedonia by their own conclusion. Now, it's interesting that Bithynia was blocked by the Holy Spirit, Turkey was blocked by the Holy Spirit, but Macedonia, we're never given any indication that the Holy Spirit directed them to Macedonia. They got to Macedonia by their own conclusion, which means this, they discerned the will of God because what God did didn't want them to do was clearer than what God did. Don't, don't, don't lose me. In Twitter form, 
God's no is always louder than God's yes. That what God does not want you to do, God is able to block clearly. But where God wants you to do comes to the conclusion and passion and moving in that direction and finding out in a real sense, they were able to discern the will of God, not through God's yes, but through the absence of God's no. God, you didn't, yeah, you didn't catch it. Here's what happens. They try to go to Turkey. And the Holy Spirit blocks it in some way. They try to go to Bithynia, and the Holy Spirit blocks it in some way. They try to go to Macedonia, and they conclude that Macedonia must be the right direction because there was no blockage or interference from the Holy Spirit. And since God did not say no, that must be the direction God wanted them to go in. That sometimes we discern the right road because God keeps the door open. Hear me. There's one passage of scripture I really, 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 really want you to memorize. It, it, it's one of the most prophetic promises in all of scripture. And it's one that we don't hang our hat on enough. It comes to us in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7 when Jesus says this. I can close a door no man can open. And I can open a door no man can close. That we serve a God who is able to shut down the wrong road and open up the right road. God can block and prevent you from moving in the wrong direction. And God can swing wide open the door that leads you down the right path. Here's what God says. So I can close it and lock it. Or I can open it up. But watch this. You won't know which one it is. Till you try the door. Paul says, I didn't know we couldn't go to Turkey till we tried. I didn't know we couldn't go to Bithynia till we tried. And I didn't know Macedonia was the right road until we tried to go to Macedonia. Somebody, the reason you're quiet, because you just figured out you've been doing this whole thing wrong. You got it backwards and twisted. Because you've been laying out with oil on your head, begging the Lord to show you what you ought to do, what road you ought to take, what job you ought to apply for, which direction you ought to go in. And God says, listen, that's not the way it works. you got to make an effort to move in a direction. And trust me that if it's not the right road, I can close the door and shut it down and redirect you down the right path. You got to trust that when your prayer is to do the will of God and you've bathed it in prayer and you said, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I will do. You've got to trust God enough that if you make a decision to follow your passion and your thinking and you move in the wrong direction, God is so much God that he can shut it down before your life is destroyed and redirect you in the right path. Can I prove it to you real quick? Is there anybody here that knows about the ministry of closed doors? You know what it's like for God to shut an option down, for God to lock it out, for God to say no? And God is so good that God can shut it down before you get too far outside of his will. The best way to explain this, um, if, if, if you were here uh, prior to 2008, you probably already know this, but most of y'all are post-2008. If you're post-2008, raise your hand. If you, if you come after 2008, so the majority of you all don't know this. I want to share with you how I got to Alfred Street Baptist Church. C can I testify? Uh, I didn't do it on New Year's Eve, so I'm going to do it tonight. Uh, um, before the Lord brought me to Alfred Street, I was pastoring a church in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, it's a good church, good church. Uh, they were kind to me. They took me in at 25 when I didn't know too much anything. And I just graduated out of seminary and had been turned down to pastor uh, my home church in Chicago. And, and this church, they hired me. I needed a job. And they, they thought I could they'd give me a chance. It was an older church, kind of like Alpha Street. Not, not as old as y'all, but they're about 150 years old. 
Um, and, you know, it, it was good church. Now, m now, Mom, they said they had 200 members, but about 60 of them showed up every Sunday. We had, and we, we were glad when we had 60. We were glad when we had 60. And in 10 years of being there, that church grew from 200 to 3,000. The hand of God was upon it. God did great things. We were 3,000 strong. We, we were in a building project, and after 10 years, I was the pastor. He didn't have no committees and boards. <laughs> Wasn't no voting. I was the pastor. And then I, I, I liked that. I was comfortable where I was, but I wasn't growing. In 2006, my world was changed when my father died. My father was not only my father, but my best friend. He's my mentor in ministry. I talked to him every day. And for almost 20 years, there was never a sermon I preached where he didn't pray with me before I preached. When you lose someone like that, it shakes your whole world. And I had to take a sabbatical from church because I didn't know if I could preach without my father. I didn't want to do it anymore. It's a real disturbing time for me trying to discern and pray for what God wanted me to do because I, I was done. I didn't know that the deacons at my former church had told my administrative assistant that if ever a posting for a new pastoral position comes to the office, put it in the garbage can. Don't let him see opportunities outside of this church. They, I guess they didn't want to lose me, so I was never supposed to get a piece of mail telling me about another job. When I came back off a of sabbatical, all my mail was in a folder, and I was going through it, and in that folder was the job posting for the pastor of the Alpha Street Baptist Church. Now, I wasn't supposed to get that. Holy Spirit. She should have been fired. But I got the announcement, and I read through it, and I was intrigued. I began to ask the Lord, God, is this something you want from me? This is in 2006. I began to pray about it, and I was conflicted. I didn't know whether I should fill out the application or not, send in a resume. I felt like it was being unfaithful to the church I was at to be preaching to them but be courting y'all. I went on your website to look at the church. I was impressed by some things and unimpressed by others. I was impressed by the history, the strength, the church. Read the history that pastors stayed about 40 years, sound like good job security. <laughs> uh, but I was unimpressed with the lack of some new millennial ministries. Y'all weren't online, you weren't streaming. Didn't have a wanna at the church. I was unimpressed by some things. And I began to pray and ask the Lord, what should I do? And the only thing I heard God say, I'll close a door no one can open, and I'll open a door no one can close, but you'll never know unless you fill out the application. You'll never know if it's my will if you don't try. So I decided, I was going to fill out the application, and I was going to give it my best. I was going to do it with an excellent spirit because you'll never know how God can bless until you give your best. So I, I, I put me the best me I could on paper. Y'all, I drew the best me I could. I made me look good on paper, and I sent it to the committee. It was due November 16th, 2006. November 20th, 2006, four days after I sent in the application, my youngest son, Cooper, was born three months premature. He weighed a pound and a half and fit in my hand. For three months, he was in NICU, neonatal intensive care, and then he went to PICU, pediatric intensive care. For three months, he lived 
in a plastic box. And I'm not saying a few days or every now and then, but every day for three months, I spent 12 or more hours staring at that box. Spent Christmas Day in that hospital staring at that box because I didn't want him to be alone. And while he was there, there was a young girl in NICU next to him who passed away. And it scared me. And I believe my job was to pray that that death angel would pass over my son. I say that to say that after I turned in the application, y'all would know my mind. I was not thinking about no Alfred Street Baptist Church. I was thinking about Cooper Wesley. When he came out of intensive care, we were able to bring him home, I got a call from the pulpit committee, chaired by Deacon Garrett and six others on there, and they invited me to come for an interview. I'll close a door no one can open, and I'll open a door no one can close. Now, I figured this must be God's directing because if, if it wasn't the will of God, I wouldn't have gotten an interview. So I decided to come for an interview, and it turned out that we had a pop, but maybe six or seven interviews. Some of them were real good, and some of them wasn't. <laughs> we had some uh, praise the Lord moments and some come to Jesus moments. <laughs> and because I believed that the interview, Mary wasn't just about Y'all trying to figure out if you wanted me. I want to figure out if I wanted you. So I asked questions in the interview. And we had some ups and some downs. The committee decided they would let me come. And I was invited to do the men's retreat that year in 2007. And then I was allowed to preach on men's day. I came and preached the very best sermon I could. I sweated. I shouted. I tried to get y'all to shout. You didn't, but... Uh, <laughs> I did the very best I could under the circumstances. Um, it was a different church back then. Um, and, and the only thing I kept hearing, I'll close a door no one can open, and I'll open a door no one can close. In the fall of 2007, the pulpit committee called and said to me, We've prayed about it, and we believe you're the one God has chosen to succeed John O. Peterson. And according to our Constitution, we can only present one candidate to the church to vote on, and you're the one we want to present. We've chosen you to be the potential candidate to be the eighth pastor of Alpha Street Baptist Church. Now, those who are here in 2005 know, 2008 know this. I turned it down. I went back in prayer. And I believed erroneously at the time that the Lord was telling me, well, we're really the Lord. Let me tell you why I turned it down. I'm going to be honest. Because at the time the pulpit committee called to present me as a candidate, I was celebrating my 10th anniversary at the church I was at. And Judy, they threw me a big banquet. <laughs> they bought me a watch. Everybody was giving testimonies about how much they loved Pastor Wesley. And I lost vision by the applause of the people. Not only that, but I'll be honest, I was scared to come here. My interaction with the pulpit committee led me to believe that coming here would cause me to grow in ways I had not grown thus far. Pulpit committee challenging me on the language I used in sermons. I was going to have to clean my preaching stuff. Don't nobody tell me how to preach. <laughs> I was at a church where I was pastor 10 years. I, 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 I ran the church, and y'all have 40 deacons. And then, you know, if you look at the website back in 2008, it ain't what it was now. They have pictures of the leadership up. And, and Pop Isaac, I tell you, the picture of you on that website just frightened me. Pop just didn't look like, like he was happy. He looked like he was mad. And I was like, Lord, I ain't going over there and mess with them folk. I ain't, I ain't going down there to have to vote on nothing. And 
and them telling me what I can and cannot preach and they ain't even no line. Lord, I ain't doing all that. I'm staying where I am. I'll close the door. No one can open. I went back to my old church and y'all, I'm telling you, within three weeks, it went from happy anniversary to hell. <laughs> now, I understand they went from Hosanna in the highest <laughs> to crucify him. <laughs> See, y'all think it's funny. Uh, they, they, the leadership had turned on me because they found out I had applied to be the pastor of Alpha Street Baptist Church, and now they didn't want me anymore. Y'all, I'm talking about, Mark, Mark, I was sitting in meetings with leaders, and they referred to me as him while I was at the table. <laughs> I go, y'all know I'm sitting right here. I mean, it got ugly, and it wasn't because they were bad people, but God was blocking my going back to where he was closing a door. And so, the Lord humbled me, and I had to do one of the most terrifying things I've ever done in life. I had to call the pulpit committee back at Alpha Street Baptist Church and beg them for another chance. I said, L -l 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 -d 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 listen, I know one of the most uh, important things that you want in your pastor is to be anointed and have vision and be aligned with the will of God. And I just want to let you know that usually I get things right, but, but my alignment was wrong. My decision was wrong. C could y'all please, listen, they about to fire me over here. Can y'all please give me another chance? Now, the reason I was afraid of making that phone call was because there were 400 applications to be pastor of this church. And the last four that the pulpit committee had selected were men of great character and caliber who could have stood and led this church. There were four others that were equally as called as I could have been. And my fear was that the church had moved on, that they had put up another candidate, and that y'all already had another pastor. And when I called, the committee was still on pause. Because I'll open the door. that no one can close. So, 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 I called Deacon Garrett. I said, Deacon, um, I need y'all to prayerfully reconsider. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord is moving in a new direction. <laughs> and you know, we, we don't want to violate God's will. And, and, and uh, could, could you could give brother another chance? And Dean Garrett said to me, what, what nobody wants to hear when time is critical, we'll pray about it. <laughs> no, 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 I need y'all to say yes. You ain't got to pray about it. We, we, I'm telling you what the Lord has said. Y'all ain't, said, pray about it. And they took six weeks to pray about it. Now, the longest six weeks of my life, they called back and said, listen, we still believe you're the one God has called. I'll close a door no one can open, and I'll open a door no one can close. The problem was, Dean Garrett was talking to me, he said, listen, the problem is the church knows you turned them down. Alpha Street's a proud church. You, you turned us down. Okay? So the problem we have is that although we believe you're the one, you've got to be voted on by the congregation, and the congregation knows you turned them down. And according to the Constitution, you've got to get 67% of the votes to be the next pastor. And we don't know if you can get 67% of the votes of people who know you turn them down. I'll close the door no one can open. I'll open the door no one can close. Came. It was a Tuesday night. Y'all voted. <laughs> Didn't get 67%, got 97 And the Lord... The Lord opened a door that even though I made the wrong decision and tried to go it back where I was called, the Lord blocked that path and kept the door open for the path I was supposed to walk on. Now, I guess God knows me. Let me tell you a funny part of the story. Some of y'all know. I guess God knows me and knows that even that vote, I, pro I, I wasn't certain I probably may have still tried to go back. So let me tell you what God did. Let me tell you what God did. Y'all voted for me on a Tuesday night, Tuesday night. 
and was, y'all were told to keep it quiet. <laughs> there are no secrets in the kingdom of God. <laughs> and apparently someone from Massachusetts called up here and whoever answered the phone told them that I had been elected as a pastor of Al Street Baptist Church. True story. Y'all voted me on Tuesday night. Wednesday night, 11 o'clock, the very next day, 24 hours later, the 11 o'clock news, Channel 5, NBC, the second story after a shooting in Springfield, second story before I could even get to my church on Sunday. Y'all voted on Tuesday. <laughs> on Wednesday night, the news, prominent pastor leaving for D.C., and NBC ran a story on me coming to Alfred Street before I'd even had a chance to tell my church I was leaving. My phone rang at 11.07. <laughs> it was the chair of my deacons. He said, Pastor, we got a problem. I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> I got up on church that Sunday morning. True story. First words out of my mouth, I have something to tell y'all. Sister in the back got up, we know... Well, you got something to tell us. <laughs> that, that was the end of my time in Springfield, Massachusetts. <laughs> Because I will close a door that no matter what, you can't open it. And I will open a door that no matter how many mistakes you make, you can't close it. No matter how many people don't want to see it happen, they can't close it. No matter how many obstacles stand in the way, they can't close it. And I thank God that he's able to direct us through closed doors that we might walk through the open door that he has ordained for us. So here's what you do. You bathe it in prayer. You fast over it. And then you move in the direction that you feel you ought to go. And trust God enough that if that's not what he wants you to do, he can close the door that you'll never be able to open. And he'll leave open a door that no one can close, no matter how long it takes you to get there. If that's God's will, that door will always be open.